So we're going to read, act, read Acts 4 and 5 of The Winter's Tale. And we begin with Act 4, Scene 1, Enter Time, the Chorus. And as I said uh, Tuesday, this is a kind of extreme departure from the preservation of the unities, which everybody, which a lot of people touted as necessary to drama, based on Aristotle and ancient uh, dramatic practice. But the Renaissance playwrights were pretty loose about compromising on those when they wanted to. And Shakespeare, completely free if he wished to adjust them. And here he adjusts them as, as far as he can. 14, 16 years pass. But he's got to have somebody say that so that we know it. And he makes it an allegory. He gives us a speaker, time the chorus. <clears throat> I that please some try all, both joy and terror of good and bad that makes and unfolds error. So this is all subordinate clauses, but they're, they're proverbial. They're kind of cliches. Time both makes and mars, and it unfolds error. The motto of the novel on which this play is based, the romance by Robert Greene called Pandosta was, truth is the daughter of time. Truth is the daughter of time. So it's that that inspires Shakespeare, because in the end, truth will out. That's the, that's the principle. In time, the truth becomes known. So I that please some try all, both joy and terror. I that please some that try all, both joy and terror of good and bad that makes and unfolds error, now take upon me in the name of time to use my wings. Impute it not a crime to me or my swift passage that I slide o'er 16 years and leave the growth untried of that wide gap. Since it is in my power to o'erthrow law and in one self-born hour to plant and o'erwhelm custom. Time has the power both to plant custom, to invent it, to start it going, and to overthrow it. In time, things change. That's the point. Laws pass away, laws come to be, it all happens in time. Let me pass the same I am, ere ancient order was, or what is now received. I'm the same, time is the same, whether we're talking about the past or the present. I witness to the times that brought them in. So shall I do to the freshest things now reigning, and make stale the glistering of this present, as my tale now seems to it. My tale now seems uh, stale to the time in which I am telling it, that is Shakespeare's time on the stage, and the time of the telling on Shakespeare's stage will eventually seem stale to us. So if you think about 15th, 16th century, you're thinking about, or early 17th century this is, you're thinking about an old time. It seems stale. What's new is us. It's alive. It's, it's fresh. It's glistering. It's shining. So it works. It brings us into the relation to time. So where we are is in the center of time, always. And the past to us seems old, and what's happening now is fresh. But to the future, What's happening now will seem old, and what's hap what will happen then seems fresh. And time is there throughout. Your patience this allowing, I turn my glass and give my scene such growing as you had slept between. Leontes leaving the effects of his fond jealousy so grieving that he shuts up himself. Imagine me, gentle spectators, that I now may be in fair Bohemia. So we're going to leave Leontes alone and assume that he's shut himself up in despair, or at least in sorrow and repentance. And now we're coming to Bohemia, and 16 years have passed. <clears throat> and remember well, I mentioned a son of the kings, which Florizel I now name to you, and with speed so paced to speak of Perdita, now grown in grace equal with wondering. The last girl character that Shakespeare writes in, before he retires in The Tempest, the next play, 
is named Miranda, to be wondered at. So here he's already saying that Perdita, whose name means lost, is also equal with wondering. She is to be wondered at. And the name of the king that we heard about when he was comparing how he loves his son to how uh, Leontes loved Mamilius um, is Florizel. So flora means flowers, and we're going to have a lot of flowers pretty soon. What of her ensues, I list not prophesy, but let time's news be known when tis brought forth. So that part I'm not going to tell you. You're going to see it on the stage. A shepherd's daughter, and what to hear it hears, which follows after. Now those two words were rhymes in Shakespeare's time. Daughter and otter is how after was probably pronounced, although in, in upcountry places, sometimes uh, they, they wrote daughter as dafter, rhyming with after, but in Shakespeare's London, that probably was not the case. It was probably daughter and otter. A shepherd's daughter and what to hear it hears, which follows after, is the argument of time. The argument is the point. It's the thing that time is telling you. Of this allow, if ever you have spent time worse ere now, if never, yet that time himself does say he wishes earnestly you uh, never may. If, you've, if you haven't spent time worse than just now, then you're, you're lucky and let's hope you never may. All right, act four, scene two. Enter Polixenes and Camillo uh, in prose. Okay, these are a king and his chief counselor. Why in prose? Because we're going to shift to verse. And then we're going to shift to prose. And there's going to be a lot of prose in this scene. And then we're going to go into beautiful verse when we get Florizel and Perdita together. So the practical kind of uh, background exposition stuff is in prose. And then we're going to get the poetry in poetry. So what is it? Camilla wants to go home. It's been this long time. The king, I hear, is repentant, Leontes. <clears throat> and Polixenes says, don't talk about going home. I can't bear to think of it. Uh, you need me here. I, you've helped me so much in the last 16 years, and I can't do without you. So what's going on with the prince? Well, we've got some issues with the prince. He's removed from court. He sell them from the house of a most homely shepherd, line 38, a man they say that from very nothing and beyond the imagination of his neighbors is grown into an unspeakable estate, meaning wealth. Why? We know why. He found all that gold in there. Now, he's not spending it because he thinks it's fairy gold, and if he tries to spend it, it'll disappear. But <clears throat> he's had a lot of good fortune since this happened. I have heard, sir, of such a man who hath a daughter of most rare note. A note, meaning uh, worth noting, worth paying attention to. Uh, and rare, meaning rarely beautiful, like a, a rare beauty. The report of her is extended more than can be thought to begin from such a cottage. So already we're in the world of she's better than her surroundings than the shepherd could have brought up. She, something else is going on here. Polixenes, I've heard the same thing. It's likewise part of my intelligence. Uh, we're going to go into disguise, and we're going to go see what's going on there. Because even though she's very beautiful and everybody says she's wonderful, we cannot have the heir to the throne of Bohemia fraternizing with the daughter of a shepherd. That would not be a good match. Next scene, enter Autolycus. I think I mentioned Autolycus is the name of Odysseus's grandfather. And he was famous as a marauding chieftain. In, in Homer, um, it is not shameful to be more powerful than your neighbor and take what you want of his. That's what people did. And they made fame and glory by doing that. So Paris taking Helen is part of that tradition. And the, the uh, Hellenes going to Troy to take her back is also part of that. So in, uh, amidst all the heroism of the stories that we know, there, there is this tradition of uh, marauding into other people's territory and taking what you want. So that's Autolycus. And it turns out that Autolycus is a comical character, and he is a thief by profession. And he comes in singing. Now, remember, we've seen, 
storm, death, a bear eating poor Antigonus, and, and uh, the girl, the child found, and now 16 years later, he comes in singing. When daffodils begin to peer with hay, the doxy over the dale, why then comes in the sweet of the year, for the red blood reigns in the winter's pale. So the red blood takes over the government of the time. Um, the, the domain of winter and also the, the uh, paleness, the pallor of winter. So daffodils, when do daffodils bloom? Spring, spring early spring. So now we're, we're going to have a whole lot of talk about spring and summer and midsummer and high summer and late summer. The white sheet bleaching on the hedge with hay, the sweet birds, oh, how they sing, doth set my pugging tooth on edge, for a quart of ale is a dish for a king. Okay, we're in the country. People draw, dry their clothes, their sheets and towels and whatever, <clears throat> their laundry, on shrubbery. They don't have, you know, clothes lines or clothes dryers. They put them out and they dry in the sun in the spring. They can do that in the spring. They don't wash them until there's sun. <laughs> And he's a thief, so he can walk through the lanes and pull off the shrubbery, whatever he wants to take. That's what pugging means, pilfering or thieving. The lark, the tira lira chants with hay, with hay, the thrush and the jay are summer songs for me and my aunts while we lie tumbling in the hay. So he's got some uh, loose women that he hangs out with implied by aunts. I have served Prince Florizel and in my time wore three pile, but now I am out of service. He once was a courtier at court, serving Florizel the prince, but he's been fired and kicked out. But shall I go mourn for that, my dear? The pale moon shines by night, and when I wander here and there, I then do most go right. Wander means not just, it means go off the path, right? So wherever he goes, he's going right. If tinkers may have leave to live and bear the sow skin budget, then my account I well may give and in the stocks avouch it. That is, they might uh, arrest me and put me in the stocks for thieving. I have to be careful. My traffic is sheets. When the kite builds, that is, builds her nest in spring, look to lesser linen. My father named me Autolycus, who, being as I am, littered under Mercury, was likewise a snapper up of unconsidered trifles. Mercury's changeable, right? Looks like one thing turns into something else. With dye and drab, I purchased this comparison, and my revenue is the silly cheat. That is, the person who can easily be cheated, the mark, we would say. Gallows and knock are too powerful on the highway. So being beaten to death or hung, hanged on the gallows, that scares me. I don't want to go that far. So I just go with, for the lesser linen in the country lanes. The punishments are the stocks, but nothing too much worse than that. For the life to come, I sleep out the thought of it. Reminds me of Barnardine, right? In Measure for Measure. I'm not going to die today. I don't care what you say. He's not worried about the afterlife. And he sees the shepherd's son, the clown, uh, who we said is not a circus clown, but a country fellow. And he calls out to himself, to us, a prize, a prize. This, this is someone I can cheat. So the clown comes in counting. Let me see. Every leaven weather tods. Every tod yields pound and odd shilling, 1,500 shorn. So he's talking about counting the number of uh, sh um, wool uh, amounts. It's a, it's a weight for wool, the tod. How many tods, how many sheep to how many tods, and how much that comes to in money. If the springe, that's the trap, hold the cock's mind. I cannot do it without counters. He can't do it in his head. He needs, he needs an abacus. Let me see, what am I to buy for our sheep sharing feast? So he goes through a bunch of stuff for the sheep sharing feast. Um, Rice, what will this sister of mine do with rice? We're talking about Perdita now. But my father hath made her the mistress of the feast, and she lays it on. She's making a big feast. And he keeps going on with more list of stuff. And Autolycus 
falls on the ground and cries out, oh, that ever I was born. I'm sorry I was ever born. In the name of me, oh, help me, help me, pluck but off these rags and then death, death. So he's, he's dressed in rags, that's true, but that's his clothes. But now he's pretending that he's been put into them. Alack, poor soul, thou hast need of more rags to lay on thee rather than have these off. Oh, sir, the loathsomeness of them offends me more than the stripes I have received. Whip, whipping, which are mighty ones and millions. Alas, poor man, a million of beating may come to a great matter. I am robbed, sir, and beaten, my money and apparel tamed from me, and these detestable things put upon me. What, by a horseman or a footman? A footman, sweet sir, a footman. That is, Autolycus himself goes by foot. He doesn't have a horse. He's the one who's put these clothes on himself. So we have this double meaning all the way through because he's, he's, they're intentionally, or he's intentionally misunderstanding and mistreating what the clown says, and the clown is taking it in a different sense. But we know. Indeed, he should be a footman by the garments he has left with thee. If this be a horseman's coat, it hath, been, it hath seen very hot service. Lend me thy hand, I'll help thee. Come, lend me thy hand. So he leans over to help Autolycus up, and Autolycus tenderly, tenderly, and while he's picking him up, he picks his pocket. And we see that he's picking that purse of money out of the clown's pocket. Softly, dear sir, good sir, softly, you have done me a charitable office. <laughs> you, you've, you've done charity to me. Of course, the shepherd boy doesn't realize how much charity he's unintentionally given. Dost lack money? I have a little money for thee. He goes for his purse, and Autolycus says, No, good sweet sir, no, I beseech you. I have a kinsman not past three quarters of a mile hence. I was going there. I shall have money or anything I want. Offer me no money. That kills my heart, because he'll find out his purse is gone. What manner of fellow was he that robbed you? A fellow, sir, that I've known to go about with troll me dames. I knew him once a servant of the prince. I cannot tell, good sir, for which of his virtues it was, but he was certainly whipped out of the court. His vices, you would say. There's no virtue whipped out of the court. They cherish it to make it stay there. And yet it will no more but abide. This tells us a lot. This tells us a lot about Polixenes court. It's a good place. Polixenes is a good king. Virtue wants to stay there. It's rewarded there. Vice is what's whipped out of the court. Autolycus has to buy it. Vice, as I would say, sir, I know this man well. He hath been since an ape-bearer, then a process server, a bailiff. He's describing himself all through this paragraph. Then he compassed a motion of the prodigal son and married a tinker's wife within a mile where my land and living lies. That's a, a lie. He has no land and living. And having flown over many knavish professions, hath settled only in rogue. Some call him Autolycus. Out upon him, says the clown, prig for my life, prig. He haunts wakes, fairs, and bear baitings. He's a thief, a famous thief, although he doesn't recognize him because he doesn't know what he looks like. Very true, sir, he, sir, he. That's the rogue that put me into this apparel. Not a more cowardly rogue in all Bohemia. If you had but looked big and spit at him, he'd have run. So the shepherd knows that, that Autolycus is not a fighter, right? And he says so. And Autolycus says, I must confess to you, sir, I am no fighter. <laughs> so that tells us, that, that reminds us that he is the t person they're talking about, but he's pretending to the clown that he doesn't fight Autolycus because he's no fighter. I am false of heart that way, and that he knew, I warrant him. How do you now, sweet sir, much better than I was? Yeah, I've got your money in my pocket. I can stand and walk. I will even take my leave of you and pace softly towards my kinsman. Shall I bring you on the way? No. Fare thee well. Prosper you, sweet sir, exit the clown. Your purse is not hot enough to purchase your spice. I'll be with you at, the sheep, at your sheep shearing too. If I make not this cheat, bring out another, and the shearers, that is the sheep shearers, prove sheep, meaning shorn of their money, let me be unrolled and my name put in the book of virtue. 
let me be taken out of the book of vice and put into the book of virtue. But that's not going to happen if I can help it. And then he sings this wonderful ditty. Jog on, jog on the footpath way, and merrily hint the styla. I think you all probably know what a style is, right? It's that, that little staircase you go over a fence in the country to keep the cows from going over the fence, but people can do it. So hent means to grab and jump over, take hold of and jump it. Jog on, jog on the footpath way and merrily hent the styla. Your ma a merry heart goes all the day, goes meaning walks. Your sad tires in a myla. If your heart is merry, you can walk all day. If your heart is sad, you get tired right away. And he's merry, he's happy. He just succeeded in stealing a purse of money. But generally, he's a kind of, kind of uh, positive thinking little thief. <laughs> he's good at what he does. He's good at what he does. So, how is it that the shepherd's son can read? Read. Um, probably his sister taught him. And we're not asking what language here. And how would, but how would she? She was raised by a shepherd, even though True. she was free to do She had a natural interest. Yeah, that's a good question. He's not reading much. No. <laughs> Mace. Got to suspend his beliefs. A little bit, yeah. So now enter Florizel and Perdita. So think of Romeo and Juliet, and think of Ferdinand and Miranda. What? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing will come of nothing? <laughs> Speak again. That's, that, that's about true. <laughs> All right. So Florizel says, these your unusual weeds, that means clothes, to each part of you do give a life. No shepherdess, but Flora, peering in April's front. You are the goddess Flora, dressed like this. And he has in mind paintings. You can think of Botticelli's mm -hmm. Spring, uh, uh, Primavera, of the goddess Flora dressed in a gown all of flowers, and she is the goddess of flowers. And, she, and so Perdita is dressed up as in that painting for the sheep shearing festival, and she's been dubbed the queen of the feast. This your sheep shearing is a meeting of the petty gods and you the queen on it. Sir, my gracious lord, to chide at your extremes it not becomes me. Oh, pardon that I name them. Your high self, the gracious mark of the land that is the, the, the uh, you could call it the bullseye or the, the, the thing that everybody looks at as, as the goal of their sight. You have obscured with a swain's wearing, that is, he's dressed down in like a country fellow. And me, poor lowly maid, most goddess-like pranked up. You've decorated me to look like a goddess. So she jumps on his line, and you, the queen on it, sir, my gracious lord, I'm not going to chide you because you're the prince. And pardon me that I'm even saying, but you really shouldn't be doing this to me. But that our feasts in every mess have folly, and the feeders digested with a custom, I should blush to see you so attired. Swoon, I think, to show myself a glass. I would blush to see you dressed down, and I would faint if I saw myself in a mirror dressed so far up. And he jumps on her line. I bless the time when my good falcon made her flight across thy father's ground. Now, what does this tell us? I bless the time when thy good falcon he was out hunting. And his, his falcon flew over. Flew yes. Over and he went to go pick it up. And he went to go find it, and there he met her. So who's responsible for this? This is no calculation of a person. This is nature, and great nature is identified with the entire invisible realm of divinity. So we're being told here. I, and he, said, he introduces it by saying, I bless the time. 
So from his point of view and from ours, it was a blessing that the falcon <clears throat> went over the shepherd's ground and brought him in touch with Perdita. And she says, now Jove, Jupiter, afford you cause. Let's hope you have good reason to be happy about it. To me, the difference forges dread. Your greatness hath not been used to fear. You're not used to being afraid. You're a prince. Even now, I tremble to think your father, by some accident, should pass this way as you did. And we know he's dressed up in disguise and about to show up. So she's right to fear this. Oh, the fates. How would he look to see his work so noble, vilely bound up? What would he say to see you, in other words, dressed like a shepherd? What would he say, or how should I in these my borrowed flaunts behold the sternness of his presence? How could I face the king, the sternness of the king, dressed up in this flummery, this, this uh, goddess-like clothing? To which he says, notice how their lines all interlock. They're, they're totally paying attention to each other. The sternness of his presence. Apprehend nothing but jollity. The gods themselves, humbling their deities to love, have taken the shapes of beasts upon them. That is, the gods, the, the classical gods, have lowered themselves to the level of animals to achieve their love. Do you, you see the place where I am? Act 4, scene 4. Line 27, Jupiter became a bull and bellowed, the green Neptune a ram and bleated, and the fire-robed god, golden Apollo, a poor humble swain as I seem now. Their transformations were never for a piece of beauty rarer, nor in a way so chaste, since my desires run not before mine honor, nor my lusts burn hotter than my faith. Okay, so. You don't have to worry about my dressing down like a swain. The, even the gods have lowered themselves, but they didn't lower themselves for anyone nearly as beautiful as you are. And this is not uh, an act of unchastity, which it was in the gods. All those gods took on those roles in order to seduce and, and possess sexually their, the, the women they were after. But he says, my desires run not before mine honor. My desires are not ahead of my honor, nor my lusts burn hotter than my faith. So desires and lusts are not as powerful in him as honor and faith. In other words, he's not going to sleep with her until they're married. Oh, but sir, says Perdita, your resolution cannot hold when tis opposed as it must be by the power of the king. One of these two must be necessities, which then will speak that you must change this purpose or I my life. Uh, you must change this purpose or I my life. So either you need to give up on me or I have to be somebody that I'm not. But of course, what do we know? That she is somebody that she's not. Her life will change. Thou dearest Perdita, with these forced thoughts, I prithee darken not the mirth of the feast. Or I'll be thine, this first or means either, or I'll be thine, my fair, or not my father's. That is, either I marry you, or I won't, uh, I'll be permitted to marry you, or I will reject my father. For I cannot be mine own, nor anything to any, if I be not thine. I can't belong to myself, I can't be the, the prince of uh, Bohemia, I can't become the king of Bohemia if I don't have you. To this I am most constant, though destiny say no. Be merry, gentle. Strangle such thoughts as these with anything that you behold the while. Your guests are coming. Lift up your countenance as it were the day of celebration of that nuptial which we too have sworn shall come. Whoa, they're way ahead, right? They've sworn that they will marry one day. Perdita, O oh, Lady Fortune, stand you auspicious. So she's not going to despair. She's following his advice. She's going to be cheerful. And she hopes that fortune, destiny, fate, life, nature, whatever is in charge, will make it come to pass somehow. Florizel, see your guests approach. Address yourself to entertain them sprightly, and let's be read with mirth. 
Okay, now everybody comes trooping in. Shepherd, clown, that is the old man and, the, and his son, Polixenes and Camillo in disguise, two shepherd girls named Mops and Dorcas, servants, and however many people Shakespeare had to call on to fill the stage. Shepherd, fie, daughter, when my old wife lived, upon this day she was both pantler, butler, cook, both dame and servant, welcomed all, served all, would sing her song and dance her turn, now here at the upper end of the table, now in the middle on his shoulder and his, her face afire with labor and the things she took to quench it, she would to each one sip. Okay, her face is red with running around and doing all this for people, uh, labor, and then she took drink to quench it, so then she's red with drink, and she's, to eat, she's taking a sip to each person in honor of each person. So she's not alive anymore. We don't know her, but we hear about her here, and we see that she was a lively soul. Pray you bid these unknown friends to us welcome, for it is a way to make us better friends, more known. Come, quench your blushes, and present yourself that which you are, mistress of the feast. In other words, don't be so modest and blushing and, you know, uh, withdrawn. Come forward and take on the queenship of the feast. Bid us welcome to your sheep sharing as your good flock shall prosper. Perdita, to Polixenes, okay, the very, to the king that she's afraid of ever meeting. Sir, welcome. It is my father's will I should take on me the hostess ship of the day. To Camillo, you're welcome, sir. Give me these, those flowers there, Dorcas. Reverencers. So now we start with the flowers. For you, there's rosemary and rue. These keep seeming and savor all the winter long. That is, they're evergreens. So she's giving them to the old men. Grace and remembrance be to you both. That's what they represent. Rosemary for grace and rue for remembrance. And welcome to our shearing. Polixene, shepherdess, a fair one are you. Well, you fit our ages with flowers of winter. And she says, sir, the year growing ancient, not yet on summer's death, nor on the birth of trembling winter, that's in the fall, the fairest flowers of the season are our carnations and streak gillivores, that is, jilly flowers. They're also called clove, pinks, or carnations which some call nature's bastards. Of that kind, our rustic garden's barren, and I care not to get slips of them. <laughs> I would give you flowers, not of winter, meaning your old men, but flowers of the late uh, fall, or fall, before it's winter, because you're just mature men, right? She's flattering them a little. But I don't raise those flowers. And he says, Polixenes, wherefore, gentle maiden, do you neglect them? And she says, for I have heard it said, there is an art which in their piedness shares with great creating nature. There's that phrase, great creating nature. What's her objection to the carnations? They are They're hybrids. hybrids. They're hybrids. And she doesn't like the idea of human art messing with nature. Yes. The Welcome to my course on Shakespeare. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Absolutely. You'll see it's going to develop. Say there be, says Polixenes. There's an art which, you know, works on nature. Yet nature is made better by no mean, no means, but nature makes that mean. Whatever we use to make nature better is given us by nature, okay? We have a car, right? And we're trampling on nature by driving cars. But there's nothing in a car that doesn't come one way or another from nature. Metals come from the earth, and fuels come from the earth, and so on. So over that art which you say adds to nature is an art that nature makes. So any human art is still overarched by the greater art that provides the means for human beings to make nature better. You see, sweet maid, he says, and here comes the metaphor you are looking for. We marry a gentler scion <clears throat> to the wildest stock and make conceive a bark of baser kind by bud of nobler race. So we've got a chiasmus going. 
Gentler scion means the son of a higher level being. And nobler race, also higher level. That's the beginning and the end of the, of the sentence. And the, the middle things are wildest stock and bark of baser kind. So you graft the higher thing onto the root stock of the lower. The root stock is hardier, but it's baser. It doesn't produce flowers or fruit by itself. So you graft onto the root stock this flower, and you make the, that root stock conceive a bud of nobler race. In other words, you, you marry them, you wed them in this way of grafting, and it produces this beautiful flower. This is an art which does mend nature, change it rather, but the art itself is nature. That is, the rootstock comes from nature, the bud of nobler race comes from So what's he making an argument for in metaphor? This is a, it's, it's okay for, Polixene, for Florizel to marry a shepherd girl. You would think he would think. Until, yeah. <laughs> she says, she, says, she accepts the argument so far, so it is. And he says, then make your garden rich in chili for us, and do not call them bastards. And she jumps on his line and says, I'll not put the dibble in the earth. The dibble is the thing that digs a hole to plant seeds in. I'll not put the dibble in the earth to set one slip of them. No more than were I painted, meaning with makeup, I would wish this youth, meaning Florizel, should say twere well, and only therefore desire to breed by me. That is, I wouldn't want Florizel to love me just because I was pranked up in makeup, you know, uh, uh, bringing an art to nature. I, that would not be the marriage I would want if you fell in love with my outside looks based on art. So she's not going to do it. She's not going to mingle these, these two ranks. But of course, she's, uh, she and Florizel have already committed to each other. So. What we know, this is all dramatic irony, among other things, right? What we know is she's not of a baser root stock. She's the daughter of a king. And they're a perfect match. Their fathers were best friends until Leontes went bonkers. And so her resistance to this um, adulteration of nature is, is, turns out to be right on, even when it applies to her and Florism. Here's flowers for you, hot lavender, mint, savory marjoram, the marigold that goes to bed with the sun and with him rises weeping. These are flowers of middle summer. So she first gave him them flowers of winter and then uh, said, I don't have the flowers of the fall, but I'm giving you now flowers of midsummer. And I think they are given to men of middle age. So she's got them going younger, right? From winter to fall to summer. You're very welcome to the feast. Camillo, I should leave grazing were I of your flock and only live by gazing. He can't take his eyes off her. She's so just perfect. And she says, nonsense, out alas, you'd be so lean that blasts of January would blow you through and through. Then she turns to Florizel. Now, my fairest friend, I would I had some flowers of the spring that might become your time of day and yours and yours. So when is sheep shearing? <clears throat> it's not in early spring. It's in June. It's getting on towards summer. Before, the, before it gets too hot, they have to shear the sheep of the wool, or the sheep will be too hot. And they can use it um, and prepare for the winter by using the wool. So the sheep shearing happens in approximately mid-June, early to mid-June. So she doesn't anymore have flowers of the spring, like daffodils and so on. That they might become your time of day, because you're young, and yours and yours, she looks at Mops and Dorcas, that wear upon your virgin branches yet your maidenhead's growing. O oh, Proserpina, for the flowers now that frighted thou lettst fall from Deesa's wagon, daffodils that come before the swallow dares, they're very early flowers, and take the winds of March with beauty, Violets, dim, but sweeter than the lids of Juno's eyes or Cytherea's breath. Pale primroses that die unmarried ere they can behold bright Phoebus in his strength, a malady most incident to maids. Uh, the green sickness. Maids can die of green sickness, which is lack of, of sexual fulfillment. 
if they don't get it by a certain age. Bold oxlips and the crown imperial, lilies of all kinds, the fleur de luce, that's fleur de lis, we would say, being one. Oh, these I lack to make you garlands of, and my sweet friend, to strew him o'er and o'er, to throw flowers upon you. What, like a corse, meaning corpse? No, like a bank for love to lie and play on. Not like a corse, or if, that is, if a body, not to be buried, but quick, meaning alive, and in, my, in mine arms. Come, take your flowers. Methinks I play as I have seen them do in wits and pastorals. Sure, this robe of mine does change my disposition. She's growing into the role, and she's having fun doing it. Of course, inspired by Florizel and his devotion to her. And he says, what you do still betters what is done. When you speak, sweet, I'd have you do it ever. When you sing, I'd have you buy and sell so. So give alms, pray so, and for the ordering, of your, ordering your affairs, to sing them too. When you do dance, I wish you a wave of the sea, that you might ever do nothing but that. Move still, still so, and own no other function. That is, move, always move, and always in that way, the way you move. And own no other function. Each you're doing, so singular in each particular, crowns what you are doing in the present deeds, that all your acts are queens. Well, guess what? She's a princess. If things go right, she will be a queen one day. She is the heir to Cecilia, as we know. All right. So the word crown is not accidental. He's using it as a verb. But all your acts are queens. So it's, it's not just reminding us that she's a queen and going to, or a princess and going to be a queen. It's that she is queenly. Her acts are queens. She, she behaves like royalty. Perdita. Oh, Doricles, that's the shepherd's name that he's taken on in his disguise. Your praises are too large, but that your youth and the true blood which peeps fairly through it do plainly give you out an unstained shepherd. With wisdom I might fear, my Doricles, you wooed me the false way. He's, a, he's talking pretty good, and she might be afraid that he's just doing it to seduce her. But she knows he isn't. And he says, I think you have as little skill to fear as I have purpose to put you to it. You don't, you're not really afraid of that. You know me better than that. But come, our dance. I pray your hand, my Perdita. So turtles, meaning turtle doves, pair that never mean to part. Turtle doves famous for being utterly faithful to their beloveds. I'll swear for him, she says. I'll, I'll take the oath on their behalf. Polixenes, this is the prettiest lowborn lass that ever ran on the green sword. Nothing she does or seems but smacks of something greater than herself. Yeah, right, it does. Too noble for this place. All right, let's skip ahead a little bit. In comes uh, the a servant announcing that Autolycus has got ribbons and colors and of the rainbow and uh, inkles and caddises and cambrics and lawns. He's got songs. He's got all this stuff to sell. And he comes in singing at line about uh, 315. Will you buy any tape or lace for your cape, my dainty duck, my dearer? Any silk, any thread, any toys for your head of the newest and finest wearer? Come to the peddler. Money's a meddler that doth utter all men's wearer. Don't worry about money. Come to me. I'm selling you all these great things for the festival. And then there are dancers. And we get a dance of 12 satyrs. So we got singing. We got dancing. We got flowers. We got talk of springtime, although it's summertime. We've got happiness. We've got everything just blossoming and beautiful. Now think back for a moment to Cecilia, to the winter, to the jealousy, to the horrible ex expansion of Leontes violence and destruction. And this is utterly in contrast to it. 
All right, Polixenes, after the dance, um, says to Camillo, is it not, I'm in line 343 or so, 344. Is it not too far gone? Too hot, too hot. Remember that? Is it not too far gone? Tis time to part them. He's simple and tells much. How now, fair shepherd? So this is Polixenes, the father, king, in disguise, talking to his son, whom he knows to be his son, uh, but calling him shepherd, because that's how he's dressed up. How now, fair shepherd? Your heart is full of something that does take your mind from feasting. Sooth, when I was young, sooth means truth. To, to tell you the truth, when I was young and handed love as you do, I was wont to load my she with knacks, presents. I would have ransacked the peddler's silken treasury and have poured it, into, to, poured it to her acceptance. That is, I would have bought all this stuff for her. Why haven't you bought her anything? You have let him go and nothing marted with him. If your last, if your last interpretation should abuse and call this your lack of love or bounty, you were straitened for a reply. You wouldn't know what to say. At least if you make a care of happy holding her, if she complained you didn't buy her anything, well, how are you going to defend yourself? Florizel says, not knowing it's his father, old sir, I know she prizes not such trifles as these are. The gifts she looks from me, sorry, the gifts she looks from me are packed and locked up in my heart, which I have given already, but not delivered. I've given her my heart, I haven't delivered it. Okay? They're betrothed to each other, but not married. Oh, hear me breathe my life before this ancient sir, who it should seem have sometime loved. I take thy hand, that is Perdita's hand, this hand as soft as dove's down and as white as it, or Ethiopian's tooth, or the fan snow that's bolted by the northern blast twice o'er. What follows this? How prettily the young swain seems to wash the hand was fair before. He's washing it clean and white with words, even though it's already white. So remember, white, the lighter the skin, the more ideal the, the woman uh, in, in the classic Renaissance idea of beauty. And this is partly because um, they have this Nordic blood, right? And blondes run in the family. But it's also because to have a fair skin means you're not out in the sun working. You're not getting suntanned. You are taken care of. You've got servants. My teachers had an aunt who bragged that her skin had never in 70 years been seen by the sun. They weren't that rich but they were well enough off, the father was a doctor, to have servants. But isn't it supposed to be good to be da damasked, you know, like... Red, red and white. Yeah, but you get red. No, so not suntan red, not sunburn red, no, blush red. Modesty. <laughs> the blush is modesty. That's, pe that's the peaches and... I was actually going to ask that because I took her blushing as being from, you know, the romance that she would, you know, that you blush when you're... Yeah, she's blushing, but it's modesty. It's modesty. That's, the, it's that's the meaning of peaches and cream, right? The cream is the white skin, and the peaches is the blushing for modesty. So, um, I have put you out, says Polixenes, but to your protestation, let me hear what you profess. Do, and be witness to it. And this my neighbor, too? That's Cam can Camillo hear it also? And he and more than he. And men, the earth, the heavens, and all, that were I crowned the most imperial monarch, thereof most worthy, were I the fairest youth that ever made eye swerve, that is handsomest, had force and knowledge more than was ever man's, I would not prize them without her love. For her, employ them all. Commend them and condemn them to her service or to their own Perdition. <laughs> to her, to the service of Perdita or their own perdition. Those are your two choices. To all of his qualities. Polixenes, fairly offered. Camillo, this shows a sound affection. 
But, says the shepherd, my daughter, say you the like to him? Perdita, I cannot speak so well, nothing so well, no, nor mean better. By the pattern of mine own thoughts, I cut out the purity of his. That is, I feel exactly the same way. Shepherd, take hands, a bargain. So this is the father of the daughter giving his daughter to the shepherd as a wife. Okay, it's not the marriage yet, but it's the betrothal. It's the official betrothal. And friends unknown, you shall bear witness to it. I give my daughter to him and will make her portion equal his. So Florizel says, oh, that must be in the virtue of your daughter. One being dead, that's Polixenes, who happens to be standing right here. I shall have more than you can dream of yet, meaning the whole kingdom. Enough then for your wonder. But come on, contract us for these witnesses. I mean, he doesn't tell them that's what he means. We know that's what he means. And the shepherd says, come your hand and daughter yours. Polixenes, soft swain a while, beseech you. Let's wait a minute. Have you a father? I have, but what of him? Knows he of this? He neither does nor shall. Methinks a father is at the nuptial of his son a guest that best becomes the table. Pray you once more, is not your father grown incapable of reasonable affairs? Is he not stupid with age and altering rooms? Can he speak, hear, no man from man, dispute his own estate? Lies he not bedrid, and again does nothing but what he did being childish? Is he gone into second childishness that you don't want him to be here for this ceremony? No good, sir. He has his health and ampler strength indeed than most have of his age. That's good to hear from your son that he thinks that of his father. By my white beard, that's a fake beard probably, you offer him, if this be so, a wrong, something unfilial. Reason my son should choose himself a wife, that is, it's reasonable. But as good reason, the father, all whose joy is nothing else but fair posterity, should hold some counsel in such a business. Florizel, you're right, I yield all this. But for some other reasons, my grave sir, which tis not fit you know, I not acquaint my father of this business. What are his reasons? Because his father's the king, and the king's going to forbid this marriage. Let him know it. He shall not. Prithee, let him. No, he must not. That's one line. He shall not, prithee, let him. No, he must not. Let him, my son, says the shepherd. He shall not need to grieve at knowing of thy choice. Come, come, he must not. Mark our encounter. Now, why does the shepherd say he shall not need to grieve? Because whoever he is, and however much he's got, short of the king, of course, I'm going to give this girl a, a whole pot of gold. Right? <laughs> it came with her, and I've been saving it up. So it doesn't matter how rich your father is, I'm going to match it. But of course, he doesn't know it's the king. Florizel, mark our contract. Polixenes, mark your divorce, young sir. Boom, removes the disguise. Whom son I dare not call. Thou art too base to be acknowledged. Thou, a scepter's heir that thus affects a sheep hook. You know what a sheep hook is, right? It's the crook that the shepherd uses. Okay, and the scepter, the heir of the king. Thou old traitor, that he's, he's talking now to the shepherd, the old shepherd. Thou old traitor, that's bad for a king to say to somebody. It means death. I am sorry that by hanging thee I can but shorten thy life one week. Notice, not cutting off your head, because he's not a nobleman, but hanging, which is the punishment for a lower class. I'm sorry that by hanging thee I can shorten thy life one week. You're already so old that I'm, I'm not taking much away if I kill you. And thou, fresh piece of excellent witchcraft, he's talking to Perdita. Peace means masterpiece, magnificent piece of witchcraft. Uh, do you remember Othello's, the, uh, Brabantio's accusation of Othello? He's one Desdemona by witchcraft. So he's almost accusing her of that. 
who of force must know the royal fool thou copest with. Oh, my heart, says the shepherd, I'll have thy beauty scratched with briars and made more homely than thy state. I'm going to make your beauty uglier than your condition as a shepherdess. For thee, fond boy, if I may ever... Now, obviously he's in a rage and he's over, over the top. <laughs> Uh, for thee, fond boy, if I may ever know thou dost but sigh that thou no more shalt see this knack, as never I mean thou shalt, we'll bar thee from succession, not hold thee of our blood, no, not our kin. Who does this sound like now? It sounds like Leontes. Yes, it sounds like Leontes. So this, this dangerous passion is being imitated here. It's not the same situation, but it's uh, because, of course, he has some justification here, thinking this is a shepherd girl. So, but his threats are pretty wild. No, not our kin. Farther than Deucalion off. We're going to hold you further off than Deucalion. Deucalion was the ancient Greek version of Noah, right? The, the period of the flood, the ancient flood. We're, we're going to hold you further away than, you know, this thousands of years of separation. Mark thou my words, follow us to the court. Thou churl to the shepherd. For this time, though full of our displeasure, yet we free thee from the dead blow of it. In other words, he's not going to kill him on the spot. And you, enchantment to Perdita, worthy enough a herdsman, yea, him too that makes himself but for our honor therein unworthy thee, if ever henceforth thou these rural latches to his entrance open, if you open up the gate to let him in, or hoop his body more with thy embraces, I will devise a death as cruel for thee as thou art tender to it. Exit. <sighs> Just what she was afraid of. Looking really bad. Now Florizel will be tested. You know, I'll be yours or not my father's. And now we're going to see. She says, Perdita, even here undone. I was not much afeard. For once or twice I was about to speak and tell him plainly the selfsame sun that shines upon his court hides not his visage from our cottage but looks on alike. We're all children of the same sun. But it's, what is it in her that's daring to even think of saying this? Her royalty of nature. Will it please you, sir, be gone? She says to Florizel. I told you what would come of this beseech you of your own state. That's everything that state means. Your own condition, your state of mind, your, the state of Bohemia, the state of being the son of your father, the heir to the throne, of your own state, take care. This dream of mine, being now awake, I'll queen it no inch farther, but milk my ewes and weep. Camillo hasn't run off with the king. Why, how now, father, speak ere thou diest to the shepherd. If you don't express yourself, you're going you're to explode. I cannot speak, nor think, nor dare to know that which I know. Oh, sir, you have undone a man of four score three. That's to Florizel. I'm 83 years old. That thought to fill his grave in quiet, yea, to die upon the bed my father died, to lie close by his honest bones. But now some hangman must put on my shroud and lay me where no priest shovels in dust. O oh, cursed wretch, that knewest this was the prince and wouldst adventure to mingle faith with him? Undone, undone, if I might die within this hour, I have lived to die when I desire. So finally Florizel speaks. Why look you so upon me? I am but sorry, not afeard, delayed, but nothing altered. What I was, I am. More straining on for plucking back, not following my leash unwillingly. So, Camillo, you know your father's temper. I'm not going to read all this. Um, but Camillo has a plan, okay? Camillo thinks... Uh, Florizel's going to take her and run away. He's going to take, he's going to take Perdita and he's going to run away. Leave the king, abandon uh, uh, Bohemia and run off. And Camillo says, okay, I'll tell you what, if that's what you're going to really do 
and you're determined to do it, he tests them and he asks them and they argue. I wish I had time to read it all, but I don't. Um, and he says, okay, I'll tell you what. Get a ship, fly away with her, go to Sicilia. Go to Sicilia. I can tell you all the secret things between the two former friends to say you're going to pretend to be on a mission from your father, and that way um, you'll be safe and we'll know you'll be taken care of uh, because there's now peace between them, right? He's repented. Um, and his secret intention is what? Go back to the king and say, they've run off. I know where. They've gone to Sicilia. Let's go. What has Camillo always wanted for the last 16 years? He wants to go back. He wants to go back. <laughs> well, I don't know, but... Um, so I'll just read a little of the Autolycus speech just to give you a list. Ha! Ha! What a uh, Act 4, scene 4, of course, we're in a very long scene. Line 595. What a fool honest he is, and trust his sworn brother, a very simple gentleman. I have sold all my trumpery. That is, everything he brought in to sell, he sold. Not a counterfeit stone, not a ribbon, glass, pomander, brooch, table book, ballad, knife, tape, glove, shoe tie, bracelet, horn ring to keep my pack from fasting. My clown who wants something to be a reasonable man grew so in love with the wench's song that he would not stir his petty toes till he had both tune and words, which drew the rest of the herd to me that all their other senses stuck in ears. You might have pinched a placket. It was senseless. It was nothing to geld a codpiece of a purse. At these country fairs, men would wear their purses, take carry their purses in their codpiece. That's the, the uh, bag that holds the male genitals. And they put it there because if somebody tried to filch the purse, they'd feel it, right? And pinch a placket is the female, cor the female corresponding spot. You could do either. Um, and they wouldn't know it because they were all taken up by this song. All right. They make Autolycus change clothes. And I want you to go to line 675 uh, so, or so. <clears throat> They've made Autolycus give his clothes to Florizel, and Florizel given Autolycus his clothes. Florizel doesn't recognize Autolycus as his former servant because he's dressed down so far. <clears throat> And when they go out, Autolycus says, the prince himself is about a piece of iniquity, stealing away from his father with his clog, meaning Perdida, at his heels. If I thought it were a piece of honesty to acquaint the king with all, I would not do it. I hold it the more knavery to conceal it, and therein am I constant to my profession. So he's not going to give him away. Then in comes the shepherd. And the shepherd says, can you show me the way to the king? And Autolycus says, oh, yes, I'm a courtier. I know, because he's now wearing fancier clothes. I know the way to the king, but you're going to have to pay. Uh, why does the shepherd want to go see the king? Because he's got this basket of information about Perdita and all this money. It's not what you think he wants to say to the king. She's really royalty. Aside, Autolycus says at line 709, though I am not naturally honest, I am so sometimes by chance. <laughs> Takes off his beard, pretends to be a courtier, and he gets them to go on board the ship. And the last speech of the scene, so basically, uh, uh, Florizel and Perdita have run off on one ship to Sicilia, and following them, is, uh, uh, and, and put aboard that ship, I think that ship, is um, the shepherd and the clown, and then following them, because Camillo gave him away, is Polixenes and Camillo. So they're all chasing back to Sicilia. And where does the Polixenes go? He goes with the shepherd? And yeah. The so he says this at the very end of the scene. If I had a mind to be honest, I see fortune would not suffer me. She drops booties in my mouth. 
I am courted now with a double occasion, gold and a means to do the prince my master good, which who knows how that may turn back to my advancement. They're giving me gold to get them to see the king, and I'm taking them, tricking them onto the ship of Florizel and Perdida. So they don't betray him to the king, but I'm doing Florizel a good turn. Maybe he'll rehire me at court. I will bring these two moles, these blind ones, aboard him, meaning Florizel's ship. If he think it fit to shore them again and that the complaint they have to the king concerns him nothing, let him call me rogue for being so far officious, for I am proof against that title and what shame else belongs to it. I don't care what they call me. To him will I present them. There may be matter in it. Why is he doing this? Okay, he thinks he's doing it to cause trouble. It's more knavery to help Florizel escape than to turn him into the king. So he's being true to his dishonest nature. And there's money in it for him. And he's also thinking he'll get something out of it. That's right. Now, we also know that he's doing it for another reason, which he cannot know. Florizel and Perdita are rushing back to Sicilia for a reason they cannot know. Camillo is, knows more than just about anybody about why this is happening. None of them knows who Perdita is, except the shepherd, and she, he doesn't know the story. So great creating nature, or whatever we want to call it, is like with that falcon, pulling the will of Autolycus to do wrong into the sphere of the healing that's going to happen when everybody comes back to Sicilia. So when he says, if I had a mind to be honest, I see fortune would not suffer me, he's right. Fortune is using his dishonesty to bring good out of the whole, uh, of his purposes and out of everything else. What? It just occurred to me that he probably can't read because otherwise he would have been able to read the stuff that was in the basket that um, at the end, they, you know. Oh, you mean the shepherd? Yeah. Yeah, the shepherd. Yeah, so the, That's probably yeah. right. Yeah, yeah good, good what, thinking. Yeah. He wouldn't know. See, I'm taking your class. All right. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay, Act 5. <sighs> I can't stand how much I'm going to have to skip, but... I'm going to read a little bit of scene one, and then we'll go forward. Um, Cleomenes in Act 5, scene one. So we're back in Sicilia with Leontes, Cleomenes, and Dion. They're the ones that brought the oracle, Paulina. Cleomenes says, sir, you have done enough and have performed a saint-like sorrow. You've repented. You've redeemed yourself. You've got to get over it. Leontes, whilst I remember her, meaning Hermione, and her virtues, I cannot forget my blemishes in them, and so still think of the wrong I did myself, which was so much that airless it hath made my kingdom and destroyed the sweetest companion that e'er man bred his hopes out of. True? No. Paulina, too true, my lord. If one by one you wedded all the world, or from all that are took something good to make a perfect woman, she you killed would be unparalleled. I think so, says Leontes. Killed? She I killed? I did so, but thou strikes me sorely to say I did. It is as bitter upon thy tongue as in my thought. Now, good now, say so, but seldom. Cleomenes, not at all, good lady. You might have spoken a thousand things that would have done the time more benefit and graced your kindness better. But Paulina has a reason, yes. So I have a question back when Leontes is uh, responding to Cleomenes and he says, uh, you know, whenever I think of Hermione, I cannot forget my blemishes in her virtues and so still think of the wrong I did myself. The wrong I did? Or the wrong I did to myself. The wrong I did to myself. It's first the wrong he did to her, and then yeah. the wrong he did to himself. Yeah. By robbing himself and his kingdom of an heir yeah. and of his wife. Yeah. So he's, he's not only hurt her and Mamilius, but he's hurt himself. Yeah. And he lists why. It has made my kingdom heirless and destroyed the sweetest companion, right? 
So again, he goes back to praising her. All right. Paulina's reason is this. You are one of those would have him wed again. Dion, if you would not so, you pity not the state nor the remembrance of his most sovereign name. Consider little what dangers by his highness fail of issue may drop upon his kingdom and devour in certain, look, in certain lookers on. What were more holy than to rejoice the former queen as well? What holier than for royalty's repair, for present comfort and for future good, to bless the bed of majesty again with a sweet fellow to it? We've got to marry again. The stability of the kingdom depends on it. There is none worthy respecting her that's gone. Besides, the gods will have fulfilled their secret purposes. For has not the divine Apollo said, is it not the tenor of his oracle, that King Leontes shall not have an heir till his lost child be found? Which, that it shall, is all as monstrous to our human reason as my Antigonus to break his grave and come again to me, who on my life did perish with the infant. She doesn't know that they didn't. She's right about Antigonus. But the oracle has said, if that which is lost be not found. And she's trusting to that, as, it, as uh, Hermione is, as we'll see. "'Tis your counsel, my lord, should to the heavens be contrary, oppose against their wills." You're counseling him to marry is what's against heaven's will. "'Care not for issue,' she says to him, meaning children. "'The crown will find an heir. Great Alexander left his to the worthiest, so his successor was like to be the best." That is not a good argument. Because he did. He left his to the worthiest. And what happened? They all fought each other and killed each other. And the, the empire collapsed and got sucked into Rome. Good Paulina, who has the memory of Hermione, I know in honor. Oh, that ever I had squared me to thy counsel. I wish I'd listened to you in the first place. Then even now I might have looked upon my queen's full eyes, have taken treasure from her lips and left them more rich for what they yielded. Thou speaks truth. No more such wives, therefore no wife. One worse and better used would make her sainted spirit again possess her corpse. And on this stage where we offenders now appear soul vexed and begin why to me. She, her spirit would come to me and say, why have you done this? Married someone else. Well, Paulina tightens the screws by picking up that idea. And finally, she says at line 78, or 76, yet if my Lord will marry, if you will, sir, no remedy but you will, give me the office to choose you a queen. She shall not be so young as was your former, but she shall be such as walked your first queen's ghost. It should take joy to see her in your arms. I, I'll pick you the a wife, if you must have a wife. And we don't know what she has in mind, but something. My true Paulina, says Leontes, we shall not marry till thou bidst us. That shall be when your first queen's again in breath. Never till then. Hoo -hoo -hoo. Boom, it's over. She tricked him, it sounds like. But of course it isn't. One that gives himself out, gives out himself Prince Florizel. So po Florizel arrives with Perdita. They come bounding in. Everybody's amazed. Perdita looks like Hermione, but they don't think of her as the daughter. They just think of her as, as beautiful. Even Leontes dangerously gets an eye for her. He sees Florizel. Your mother was most true to wedlock, Prince, which is... Ironic as the first thing he says to him at line 123. Enter Florizel, Perdita, Cleomenes, and others. And he says, your mother was most true to wedlock, prince, for she did print your royal father off conceiving you. Florizel looks like his father. Okay. Florizel lies. By his command have I touched, here touched Cecilia. And from him give you greetings. Oh, my brother, says Leontes, good gentleman, to Florizel, the wrongs I have done thee stir afresh within me, 149. And these thy offices so rarely kind are as interpreters of my behindhand slackness. Welcome hither as is the spring which we were just celebrating to the earth. 
And hath he too exposed this paragon to the fearful usage, at least ungentle, of the dreadful Neptune, to greet a man night not worth her pains, much less the adventure of her person? Did, did Polixenes dare send this beautiful, perfect girl out to the dangers of the sea? More lies, she came from Libya. Enter a lord. Most noble sir, line 179, that which I shall report will bear no credit were not the proof so nigh. Please you, great sir, Bohemia greets you from himself by me, desires you to attach, meaning arrest his son, who has his dignity and duty both cast off, fled from his father, from his hopes, and with a shepherd's daughter. Where's Bohemia? Speak, here in your city. I now came from him. I speak amazedly, etc. Florizel, Camillo has betrayed me. Just what Leonti said last winter, for 16 years ago. Lay it so to his charge, he's with the king your father. Who, Camillo? Yep, Camillo's with him. Oh, my poor father, says Perdita, meaning the shepherd. The heaven set spies upon us, will not have our contract celebrated. Leontes, you are married. We are not, sir, nor are we like to be. The stars I see will kiss the valleys first, the odds for high and lows alike. My lord, is this the daughter of a king? She is when once she is my wife. I think she's a shepherd's girl, but I'm going to make her a queen. But he doesn't know that she really is the daughter of a king. That once I see by your good father's speed will come on very slowly. I am sorry, most sorry you have broken from his liking where you were tied in duty. And as sorry your choice is not so rich in worth as beauty that you might well enjoy her. Florizel, dear look up. Though fortune visible an enemy should chase us with my father, power no jot hath she to change our loves. Beseech you, sir, remember, since you owe no more to time than I do now, with thought of such affection, step forth mine advocate. At your request, my father will grant precious things as trifles. Leontes, would he do so, I'd beg your precious mistress, which he counts but a trifle. I would beg of him to have Perdita. This is vaguely incestuous. He's got an eye for this girl. Paulina, sir, my liege, your eye hath too much youth in it. <laughs> Not a month for your queen died, she was more worth such gazes than what you look on now. Hermione was even more amazing than Perdita. Leontes, I thought of her even in these looks I made. But your petition is yet unanswered. I will to your father, your honor not o'erthrown by your desires, I am friend to them and you. Upon which errand I now go toward him. Therefore follow me and mark what way I make. Come, good my lord. And they go out. Now, what do we want? What do we expect? What's supposed to happen in Act 5, Scene 2? Reunion! Clarification, opening the parcel, who everybody is, meeting up, it's going to be okay, they can get married, it's all great. Why don't we get to see this? You know how we get this? Third person narration of three random gentlemen in prose. It's an outrage. And it's particularly an outrage to the people who've read Pandosto. Because this has to be the last scene of the play. And all we're getting is these reporters telling us what happened. Some of it's quite beautiful, though it's prose. I'll read a little of it. So why did he do it? Good question. <laughs> Keep that question in mind until we get to scene three. <laughs> just, just a quick question. So it's been 16 years. And yes. And Leontes has obviously realized that, uh, what's his name, the, the other king. Both Polixenes. Polixenes hadn't really done what he... Oh, yeah, he realized that right away. Yeah, yeah. And then, meanwhile, uh, Polixenes must have known or must have learned that Leontes admitted he was mistaken. Yes, yes, so, yes. So they're... they're, they're yeah, we were told that. But he wasn't cool as there. forgiving as Camillo. And they're, they're That's true. He yeah, doesn't want Camillo to go back to Cecilia, but he's willing to go there to chase his son. And he knows that Leontes is penitent. That's clear. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he also knows that, or the kid, Florizel, knows that if uh, 
that that uh, his dad will listen to what Leontes yes. begs for or Correct. requests. Correct. Correct. It's, it's, uh, so it's he, he imagines this friendship between them restored. Yeah, they're two, the, the lambs have come back together. Yes. So why don't we get to see that? <laughs> so the third gentleman says, so we get the third gentleman listing all the things that we've, nothing but bonfires. Uh, Paulina Stewart can tell us more. He comes in. And most true, if ever truth were pregnant by circumstance, line 32, uh, Act 5, Scene 2, line 32. That which you hear, you'll swear, you see. There is such unity in the proofs. The mantle of Queen Hermione's, her jewel about the neck of it, the letters of Antigonus found with it, which they know to be his character, meaning his handwriting, the majesty of the creature and resemblance of the mother, the affection of nobleness, which nature shows above her breeding, and many other evidences proclaim her with all certainty to be the king's, meaning Leontes, daughter. Did you see the meeting of the two kings? No. We want to. <laughs> then have you lost a sight which was to be seen, cannot be spoken of? What the hell are you doing to us, Shakespeare? Are you crazy? There might you have beheld one joy crown another, so and in such manner that he seemed sorrow wept to take leave of them, for their joy waded in tears. They're crying for joy. There was casting up of eyes, holding up of hands, with countenance of such distraction that they, that they were to be known by garment, not by favor. You couldn't tell by their faces, they're all weeping. <laughs> Our king being ready to leap out of himself for joy of his found daughter, as if that joy were now become a loss, cries, Oh, thy mother, thy mother, then asks Bohemia forgiveness, then embraces his son-in-law, then again worries he his daughter with clipping her, meaning hugging her. Then again, uh, sorry, now he thanks the old shepherd, which stands by like a weather-bitten conduit of many king, kings. Reign. He's like the father of all these kings because he's saved the daughter. I never heard of such another encounter which lames report to follow it and does description and, and undoes description to do it. So you can't describe this, it's so great. And all he's doing is giving us people saying you can't describe this. Uh, what became of Antigonus? Like an old tale still. That is, it's all like an old tale. The name of the play is The Winter's Tale which will have matter to rehearse, though credit be asleep and not an ear open. You can't believe old, these old tales, but it keeps proving itself true. He was torn to pieces with a bear. This avouches the shepherd's son, who has not only his innocence, which seems much to justify him, but a handkerchief and rings of his that Paulina knows. That is, when he buried him, he saved the handkerchief and the rings. What became of his bark and followers? wrecked the same instant of their master's death and in the view of the shepherd, so that all the instruments which aided to expose the child were even then lost when it was found. Perdita means lost, but she was found. But oh, the noble combat twixt joy and sorrow was fought in Paulina. That is, she's hearing that her husband is dead. She had one eye declined for the loss of her husband, another elevated that the oracle was fulfilled. That doesn't mean she's cross-eyed. It means that she's both sad and joyful at the same time. She lifted the princess from the earth and so locks, in embracing, locks her in embracing as if she would pin her to her heart that she might no more be in danger of losing. The dignity of this act was worth the audience of kings and princes, for by such was it acted. I'm not showing you this scene, because you're not kings and princes. It was only worthy of kings and princes watching. That's what it sounds like. One of the prettiest touches of all, and that which angled for mine eyes, caught the water, though not the fish, was, that is, it made him weep, was when at the relation of the queen's death, with the manner how she came to it, bravely confessed and lamented by the king, Leontes, how attentiveness wounded his daughter, till from one sign of dolor to another she did, with an alas, I would fain say, bleed tears. For I am sure my heart wept blood. Who was most marble there? Changed color. That's a prefiguration. Some swooned, all sorrowed. If all the world could have seen it, the woe had been universal. 
Are they returned to the court? No. It so happens that Paulina has invited them to her house where she has a gallery and where she's going to show a magnificent statue of Hermione done by the famous Giulio Romano. That was the name of a Renaissance painter well known at the time. We might say by Michelangelo or Leonardo or somebody. Um, I thought she had some great matter in hand, says the second gentleman, 102. For she hath privately twice or thrice a day ever since the death of Hermione visited that removed house. Shall we thither with our company and peace the rejoicing, peace out, meaning fulfill, uh, add to the company? Who would be thence that has the benefit of access? Every wink of an eye, some new grace will be born. Yes. So with the wink of an eye, a new grace uh, will be born. The last guy that winked was the shepherd's son when he saw the bear eat Autolycus. And the oh, I haven't winked the since then. Yeah. Wink, it, it just means in a trice of time, no time at all. Yeah. In every passage of no time at all, some new grace will be born. All right, so there's one coming that we're not prepared for. But first, Autolycus and the shepherd and clown. So he says, yeah, I lied to you, but I hope you'll prefer me to court. And um, they say, yes, we will, because do you promise to amend your life? Line 150. Yes, he says. I will then swear to the prince, thou art as honest a true fellow as any in Bohemia. Shepherd, you may say it, but not swear it, because <laughs> he isn't. Not swear it? Now I'm a gentleman? Let Boers and Franklin say it. I'll swear it. Meaning once you're a gentleman, you can swear oaths all over the place. All right. Hark, the kings and princes, our kindred, <laughs> are going to see the queen's picture. Come follow us. So... The, he's, he's now made a gentleman, so now he can behave like a gentleman. And how he has seen gentlemen behave is swear up and down and lie and do everything they want. All right, so now there's one more scene. Act five, scene three. Enter Leontes, Polixenes, Flores, Alperdita, Camillo, Paulina, Lords, etc. And we're now in verse. No more prose. And we've now got our main characters. No longer random gentlemen reporting. So what? can possibly be in store that will satisfy as the climax, as the conclusion, the denouement of this play, when all of the only reunions we can possibly expect have happened off stage and been reported to us. Leontes, oh, grave and good Paulina, the great comfort that I have had of thee. Paulina, what sovereign, sir, I did not well, I meant well. All my services you have paid home. But that you have vouchsafed with your crowned brother and these your contracted heirs of your kingdoms, my poor house to visit, it is a surplus of your grace, which never my life may last to answer. I'm so grateful to you for coming to my house. Oh, Paulina, we honor you with trouble. But we came to see the statue of our queen. Your gallery have we passed through not without much content and many, in many singularities, but we saw not that which my daughter came to look upon, the statue of her mother. She doesn't know what her mother looked like, so she wants to see the statue. Did I, did I talk about Giulio Romano? Mm -hmm. I mentioned him. Um, but where does, where does he say it? Here, in the previous scene, he says, a piece of many years in doing and now newly performed by that rare Italian master, Giulio Romano, who, had he himself eternity and could put breath into his work, would beguile nature of her custom, so perfectly is he her ape. He imitates nature so perfectly, he's going to put nature herself out of business. So we're being prepared to take this statue as a convincing likeness of, Pauline, of uh, Hermione. All right, 
Paulina, as she lived peerless, so her dead likeness, I do well believe, excels whatever yet you looked upon or hand of man hath done. That's true. It exceeds whatever hand of man hath done. Therefore I keep it lonely apart, but here it is, covered with a sheet. Prepare to see the life as lively mocked as ever still sleep mocked death. Behold, and say it is well. Paulina reveals. Now, the stage direction gives the damn thing away, but the audience doesn't know this. The audience says we're supposed to think this is a statue, and there's Hermione. I like your silence, it the more shows off your wonder. But yet speak, first you, my liege, comes it not something near? Her natural posture. Chide me, dear stone, that I may say indeed thou art Hermione, or rather, thou art she in thy not chiding, for she was as tender as infancy and grace. But yet Paulina, Hermione was not so much wrinkled, <laughs> nothing so aged as this seems. <laughs> oh, Polixene says, not by much. Well, we know exactly how much, 16 years much. So much the more our carver's excellence, which lets go by some 16 years and makes her as she lived now. Now you have to remember that almost all sculpture um, until very modern times was painted, realistically painted. And all those Greek statues we've seen that are pure marble, have, the, the paint in almost all of them has been lost uh, by time. But they were painted to, to be utterly realistic. <sighs> All right, so much the more our carver's excellence, which lets go by some 16 years and makes her as if she lived now. Uh, Leontes, as now she might have done so much to my good comfort as it is now piercing to my soul. Oh, thus she stood even with such life of majesty, warm life as now it coldly stands when first I wooed her. I am ashamed. Does not the stone rebuke me for being more stone than it, that is for not weeping? O oh, royal peace, again, masterpiece, there's magic in thy majesty, which has my evils conjured to remembrance, and from thy admiring daughter took the spirit standing like stone with thee. She's just wrapped standing herself like stone, Perdita. And give me leave, and do not say tis superstition, that I kneel, and then implore her blessing. So she kneels to this statue of her mother. This is dangerously close to idol worship. Lady, dear queen, that ended when I but began, give me that hand of yours to kiss. Paulina stops her. Oh, patience, the statue is but newly fixed, the color is not dry. <laughs> My lord, says Camillo, your sorrow was too sore laid on, which sixteen winters cannot blow away, so many summers dry. Scarce any joy did ever so long live. No sorrow but killed itself much sooner. He's weeping, weeping, weeping. And Camillo's trying to comfort him. Get over it, it's sixteen years already. Polixenes, dear my brother, let him that was the cause of this. Now, he didn't mean that he was the cause, the literal cause of any adultery, of course. He just means that he was the, the uh, proximate cause. He was, the, he was the one that Leontes suspected. Um, let him that was the cause of this have power to take off so much grief from you as he will peace up in himself. Let me do some of the weeping, so you don't have to do all of it. Indeed, my lord, says Paulina, if I had thought the sight of my poor image would thus have wrought you, for the stone is mine, I'd not have showed it. If I thought it was going to make you weep like this, I wouldn't have shown it. Do not draw the curtain, meaning don't close it off again. Paulina, no longer shall you gaze on it, lest your fancy may think anon it moves. You're going to imagine that it's moving. You're looking at it so long. Also, she's kind of standing there. She's like standing there. And she's going to have to move. And it's a boy, right? It's a boy actor playing Hermione, standing still. I'm telling you, it's all in the words or it doesn't exist. If you don't believe the words, there's no play. Okay. 
But he says, no, let be, let be. Would I were dead, but that methinks already. That is, it, it does seem like she did move. What was he that did make it? See, my Lord, would you not deem it breathed and that those veins did verily bear blood? Polixenes, masterly done, the very life seems warm upon her lip. The fixture of her eye has motion in it as we are mocked with art. Paulina, I'll draw the curtain. My Lord's almost so far transported that he'll think anon it lives. Oh, sweet Paulina, says Leontes, make me to think so 20 years together. No settled senses of the world can match the pleasure of that madness. Let it alone. If I do come to believe it's alive, what more pleasure can I have? Paulina, I am sorry, sir, I have thus far stirred you, but I could afflict you farther. Do, Paulina, for this affliction has a taste as sweet as any cordial comfort. Still, methinks, there is an air comes from her. What fine chisel could ever yet cut breath? Let no man mock me, for I will kiss her. Good, my lord, forbear. The ruddiness upon her lip is wet. You'll mar it if you kiss it. Stain your own with oily painting. Shall I draw the curtain? No, not these twenty years. So long could I stand by a looker on, says Perdita. Either forbear, quit presently the chapel, or resolve you for more amazement. She's got to prepare them or they're going to die of heart attacks. <laughs> if you can behold it, I'll make the statue move indeed, descend and take you by the hand. But then you'll think, which I protest against, I am assisted by wicked powers. You'll think I'm a, a witch. Leontes, what you can make her do, I am content to look on. What to speak, I am content to hear. For tis as easy to make her speak as move. Paulina. It is required you do awake your faith. It is required you do awake your faith. Then all stand still, or those that think it is unlawful business I am about, let them depart. Leontes, proceed, no foot shall stir. Paulina, music. Okay, why music? What is music? Harmony. The music of the spheres can't be heard by human beings because we're stuck in the fallen world, in flesh, in time and space. But the angels hear the music or maybe sing the music of the spheres. And it is the ultimate form of all music. And all earthly music is an imitation, a harmony, a um, healing. People believed for a very, very long time that music could heal the spirits, drive out evil spirits, and, and invite good ones. So she's calling music, and the music has this... Um, it's not just that it's a fit accompaniment for the moment, which it is, but it's also uh, stands behind the whole idea of the healing of great creating nature. Uh, Pythagoras had a whole philosophy based on the relation of numbers and music to the reality that we experience in the world. And um, music, of course, to him meant not just the musical sound, but all, all that the muses were in charge of, all the harmonious arts. But she means play music. So she tells her servants to play music. Awake her, strike, the music plays. Tis time, she says, descend, be stone no more, approach, strike all that look upon with marvel. Come, I'll fill your grave up, Stir, nay, come away, bequeath to death your numbness, for from him dear life redeems you. So Hermione's letting her say all this to get them ready, and then she says, you perceive she stirs, and Hermione moves and comes down from the pedestal. Start not, her actions shall be holy as you hear my spell is lawful. Do not shun her until you see her die again, 
for then you kill her double. Nay, present your hand. When she was young, you wooed her. Now in age, has she become the suitor? She's kind of joking with Leontes. He takes her by the hand. Oh, she's warm. If this be magic, let it be an art lawful as eating. Polixenes, she embraces him. Camillo, she hangs about his neck. If she pertain to life, let her speak too. Aye, says Polixenes, and make, make it manifest where she has lived or how stolen from the dead. Is this a dead person come back to life? Is this a person preserved in life? Is this a statue coming to life? Like, like, what's his name? Galatea and Pygmalion. Pygmalion made a statue, fell in love with it. The gods granted him his wish, he came alive. Is that what's happening here? Paulina, that she is living, were it but told you, should be hooted at like an old tale. But it appears she lives, though yet she speak not. Mark a little while. Please you to interpose, fair madam. Kneel and pray your mother's blessing. That is, she says that to, Paul, to Perdita. Turn, good lady, our Perdita is found. And Hermione finally speaks. You gods, look down, and from your sacred vials, pour your graces upon my daughter's head. Tell me, mine own, where hast thou been preserved? Where lived? How found thy father's court? For thou shalt hear that I, knowing by Paulina that the oracle gave hope thou wast in being, have preserved myself to see the issue, the outcome. There's time enough for that. Lest they desire upon this push to trouble your joys with like relation. Go together, you precious winners all. Your exultation partake to everyone. I, an old turtle, old turtle dove, that means, loyal to my dead husband, will wing me to some withered bough, and there my mate that's never to be found again, lament till I am lost. Leontes, O oh, peace, Paulina. Thou shouldst a husband take by my consent, as I, by thine, a wife. This is a match and made between us by vows. Thou hast found mine, but how is to be questioned? For I saw her, as I thought, dead, and have in vain said many a prayer upon her grave. I'll not seek far, for him I partly know is mine, to find the unhonorable husband. Come, Camillo, and take her by the hand, whose worth and honesty is richly noted and here justified by us, a pair of kings. Let's from this place. So this, this is a really good match for her, for Camillo. They're perfect, and it's a great reward for her goodness no problem with accepting this match. Now, he says, let's from this place. What? To Hermione, look upon my brother. That is, the play began with Leontes telling Hermione to convince Polixenes to stay. <laughs> now he's telling her to look upon my brother, Polixenes. Both your pardons that e'er I put between your holy looks my ill suspicion. This your son-in-law and son unto the king, whom heaven's directing is troth plight to your daughter. Here's Florizel, meet your son-in-law. Good Paulina, lead us from hence, where we may leisurely each one demand an answer to his part, performed in this wide gap of time since first we were dissevered hastily lead away. So now they're going to go off and tell each other all the details that we know. All right. Now, why postpone the joy of the reunion? Why make it a prose scene with three random gentlemen telling all those reunions and all the facts and all the revelations, all the reveals that always have been done in the last scene in all the previous plays, 
Think of Twelfth Night. Think of uh, Tempest, even. Because Shakespeare's doing something additional. Everybody who read the, the novella, the romance, believed that Hermione was dead. Because in the story, she was. This idea of keeping her alive and appearing as a statue at the end is Shakespeare's invention. And why? Because the real reunion of this play is resurrection. This is an image of what happens at the end of life, entering heaven, when one has repented. And it might take 16 years of waiting. But what you thought was dead wasn't dead. So that the statue coming to life, it's not a literal statue coming to life, as people who read it too quickly sometimes think. It's that Hermione has preserved herself alive. Why? Because the oracle said that Perdita was alive. And she waited. Because she couldn't go back to Leontes. Why not? He was going to kill her. What? He was, he had, he told no, he was over that. Oh, after, yeah. Because the king will live without an heir until that which is lost is found. And to go back to Leontes is to beget another child. She, to conceive. He, to beget another child. Going against the oracle. No. He needed to have all that time of penance. And it's a lifetime, nearly. But then what he gets for it is not just his wife back, his daughter back, his friend back, but he gets an, a, an experience of resurrection. Death, it turns out, was the illusion. And dear life redeems you from death. And what is life? What is the source of life? So we can have hope that even Mamilius, you know, in the next life, will be there. He's not dead. Dead isn't the last thing because of this image, at least, of resurrection. Now, this is set in a pre-Christian time. So there's no idea of re th this kind of resurrection. It's a Christian idea. But Shakespeare is embedding it in this pre-Christian time, as he did in King Lear. In King Lear. To, to dramatize the spiritual reality that he and his audience do believe in officially. And to make them experience that kind of joy. So that's why he gives us all those other reunions first, uh, one remove or two removes so that he preserves that emotion that we're going to feel in the conclusion of the play for this image of resurrection. Okay, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to take your questions because I, I don't know what I can add to it. It's, it's the most shocking and dramatic theatrical coup. It's it is one of the most um, both surprising and pleasing of Shakespeare's career. And it's, its fulfillment of all of that grace that I've said be aware of through the play comes as this ultimate grace, which is the redemption of mortal human beings from death, um, and thereby becomes one of Shakespeare's very greatest plays in my Humble opinion. Okay, so ask me questions. What I noticed along the way was uh, the, uh, the young girl that was found floating in a basket or whatever it was. Uh, she was royalty. Yes. Yeah, because she was the first guy's daughter. Right. And a bunch of falsehoods went in the middle that said there wasn't such a person or somebody else did it and all that kind of thing. Uh, but toward the end, the thing I liked about most it was a very happy ending. Yes, it's a very happy ending. Yeah, but the whole thing was that this, this, the readings, you can't get out of it when I got out of it. What was it, May, the, the, the interpreter of, of uh, Shakespeare, the other book? I read that last chapter in there, and the other book it sure made more sense than that did. You could read it and understand what happened. And here was the young man. He could now marry this gal. 
because they were both royalty. And it was Correct. Just, but that wasn't even brought forward. Here. But it's, all, it's more than just the accident that she's really royal. Her royalty comes through all the way. It's, it, <coughs> so great creating nature is not making mistakes. <laughs> royalty will out. It will show itself in her character and in her nature. And it's not a disguise. It's not something you can fake. It's real. It's built in to it's the nature. Like her mother. Well, she, yeah, but she didn't know that because she'd never seen her mother. And, 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 uh, and um, Florizel had. Nurture versus nature, though. Nurture versus nature. So she had good nurture, <laughs> but she also had good well, nature. She didn't have that good of nurture. She brought it by these bumpkins. Yeah, they're bumpkins, they're but they're good. good. Well, they're good. Bumpkins. They're good. But they're still bumpkins. Yeah, but they're good. <laughs> so what she needed from them, she got. And what yeah. she needed from nature, she got. And, they, and the, the wedding of those two things is the fulfillment at the end, uh, because now she gets Florizel by right, as well as by personal merit. So it's a, it's a perfect match by the end. Yes? And she must have gotten pretty good uh, nurture, because uh, they kept her out of the sun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I guess I'm, what strikes me is that things so often are not what they seem, for good or ill. And so Leontes misapprehends the situation, and it's so far out that uh, it must be the planets, it must be a disease of the brain. Um, Othello misapprehends the situation, but that you can kind of understand because of uh, Iago. Yeah, but how can you understand Iago? No, but I'm saying uh, you have to. You can't. You have to focus on particular characters. So, so, so Othello does all these things that you know have these bad consequences, and uh, and then uh, Polixenes misapprehends the situation with his son and the shepherdess for good reason because he, he correct didn't know any better yeah. correct. So, so sometimes it's rational. Sometimes it's that's not. absolutely right. And, and that the similarity. The similarity, yes, the statue also uh, uh, fools the eye at first. The similarity between Polixenes' anger and Leontes' anger is, a gra is great, but the, the difference is profound. Um, Le Leontes is imagining something that isn't real at all, yeah. and, and Polixenes is imagining something that isn't real. But the, the reality behind the image in the error of Polixenes is a good and healing, positive one. She is a princess, etc. It's all going to be good. Whereas the, the, there is no reality behind Leontes. Now, the Othello and Leontes, I mean, this is why I put them together. They're the same character, in a sense. They're not the same kind of person. The difference is, the crucial difference is, that Leontes can repent. Leontes sees the error of his way and does repent and does penance. Othello cannot imagine repenting or doing penance because he can't imagine being in the wrong. So he treats himself in error the way he treated Desdemona in error, having learned, as I said, his fault, but not his fallibility. Leontes has learned his fallibility and because he is penitent, he is rewarded with this great joyful reunion, this ending, this resurrection. So now, the source is the same, mysterious. Because you can say, Othello, it's because of Iago, yes. But what the source of Othello's weakness that he's susceptible to Iago, and the source of Iago's will to destroy, it's, it is... It, it can't be more deeply named than, than, than calling it pride or, or he, a, devilry. Ego, ego. So Leontes is struck by that same thing. I'm going to have it my way. But when he is corrected by the death of Mamilius, unlike Othello, who's not corrected by finding out what he has done to Desdemona, um, he is corrected. He immediately repents. And he immediately goes into mourning and sorrow and penance and so on. And that takes 16 years, but then 
he can, he's rewarded. And he's rewarded, as we all hope to be, by uh, a, a reward that's beyond the measure of what can be mistaken in the world, right? At the end of this play, he's mistaking the statue for Hermione. But really, he's mistaken Hermione for a statue. He doesn't know it yet, but he finds it out. OK, so what are, what's the error that we're in when we're living our lives? We, we see a dead person, and we think that's the end of the story. And Shakespeare's saying that's not the end of the story. That's the illusion we live under, being alive in time and space in the world, subject to error, subject to erroneous impression. But the doctrine that he's putting across is that the, the, the reality of the world of the spirit of great creating nature, of grace, transcends those errors, redeems us from those errors. Just as Paulina says, life redeems Hermione from death. So the life of the universe, the life of, of the reality hidden behind things, redeems us from the illusion of death that we experience in the world. Or that's the hope, that's the ideal, that's the that's the doctrine. And the play makes that doctrine come alive for us. Now we can walk out and return to our skepticism if we want, or we can walk out and say, yep, Shakespeare had it right. I'm going to believe that from now on. Or we can be somewhere in between, which is most of us, where we waver. Is there something or is there not? Who's in charge here? Is there nothing out there or is there something going on? Is it okay to monkey with nature as much as we want? Or is there a limit that nature puts on our monkeying with nature, etc.? All those questions. Um, if you read the press, that's what you get. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions? Well, you've been a wonderful class. We like it. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes? Did, uh, the body scene that we kind of went over with jump them and thump them and did dildos exist back then? Sure. Yeah? Of course. Okay. When have dildos not existed? They were, <laughs> they were, a, major, they were a major staple of ancient Rome okay. and, and Hellenistic Greece. And that, that Lexa, I mean, it, they were called Well, it's an English word. I don't know where, what the origin of the English word is, but the thing has... It's in here. No, I know. I, it's an old word. But, uh, it's an old English word. I don't think that it comes from Latin, not, but... It's not one of the ones that he coined. But the, I don't know. I'll have to check it out. You go to the OED, it'll tell you. I was going to say, it's kind of got to be careful about Googling that one. <laughs> no, go to the OED and it'll tell you. The thing is that the thing was present for, you know, since ancient times, well known. Well, in my edition, uh, it capitalizes time. Yes. Is that, is yeah. That uh, is that yeah, I think so. Let's see. Well, in the time speech. In the time speech. Yeah. yeah. It's every time time mentions time, it's capitalized. Well, you have to be careful about this because. Shakespeare didn't typeset his plays. <laughs> so you can see what the typesetter put, and probably it corresponds to the manuscript. Yeah. Not necessarily, but usually it does. So why would he capitalize time? It's a common thing to do, because it's an allegory, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an abstraction given a, a personhood on the stage. And, th and that's very common. In, in a very early play of Shakespeare's in Henry VI, he has a character come on the stage named Rumor, capital Rumor. And Rumor tells all the rumors that are being spread that aren't true about what's going on. Yeah? What's the uh, length of time between the completion of the previous play and this play? A length of time? You mean you're asking me how long it took to write it? No, no. Uh, um, so I'm thinking of Othello and oh. how different because in Othello, the issue of his inability to sort of um, uh, to let go of his own pride and yes. therefore he kills himself. Yes. 
And so I'm just curious, sort of in a psychological way. Of you mean Shakespeare in Shakespeare's development as a... Yes. I see. Um, so Othello is 16, what? Something like 166 or 7? And this is 1611. It's not that Shakespeare wouldn't have been capable of this earlier yeah. or that later. People made a very big deal about his biographical history and corresponding periods in his writing life. But it's, it's really so intermixed that it's pretty dangerous to do that because, I mean, I don't want to say that too far. Shakespeare does develop as a thinker and a writer and a, and a poet. His language develops. He becomes much more comfortable with uh, enjambments. He begins with end stop lines. He goes much more towards enjambments as time goes on. He becomes more, in the last four plays, mystical, mm -hmm. you could say. So that's definitely part of it. It's also part of what's happening in the style around him which some people argue he's responding to, and I would argue more often he's setting it, mm -hmm. because he's coming up with these inventions, and then people are going, oh, wow, that works. Let's try that. Uh, and it works both ways. It's very symbiotic. But um, it, I wouldn't get too close to interpreting what's happening in his psyche, um, because we just don't know yeah, enough about his... But his characters also are more mature yes. in his younger years. Writing Correct. And, you can, and I have made, and people have made a very big deal about, for example, the movement from Hamlet to Lear, where in Hamlet, it's the readiness is all. And in Lear, he says, ripeness is all, mm -hmm. Edgar says. Well, that's what I'm seeing between and, those two plays. Yes. And you can imagine that having written the first one yeah. and still being alive as an imagination, you might you know, especially in a Christian world, move to that next mm -hmm. step in your psyche. And as you age and as you, you know, weaken in time, I mean, he died at 52 of some disease. So, yes, you can imagine that spiritual psychological growth in him um, clearly. I mean, you know, the, the, the stylistic, you know what I'm thinking of in, in early Rembrandt, there's a painting of the sacrifice of Isaac. Mm -hmm. Do you know it? Uh, it's, it's a color painting. The angel has grabbed Abraham by the, ar by the arm, and the knife is dropping, and Isaac is pitched back with his throat open. And, and it's utter melodrama. And then late in his life, Rembrandt does an etching of the same subject. And Isaac is kneeling with his eyes covered in humility. And Abram has his hands ready to cut him, and the angel just grabs him from behind with yeah. both arms in the most loving, sensitive, yeah. kind way. So this is the same Rembrandt, and it's the same story, but it's a totally different idea of drama, how, how you get the thing across when you're a young man, and how you get it across what, what yes. matters to be got across when you're old. So Shakespeare clearly goes through that kind of development. And you're not wrong to see that. But I wouldn't, I, I just, I would caution you in, in pinning too much yes. on that yes. as a way of interpreting Shakespeare's inner life. Because, you know, he wrote Two Gentlemen of Verona or parts of it later. He wrote Henry VIII, which has not much depth of spirit, towards the end. You know, so he could go back and forth and do different kinds of things. Five years went by between the two plays. Yeah, about didn't, five. He didn't write anything. Oh, no, he did. Oh. I mean, he wrote, he, he wrote um, Hamlet, and then Othello, and then Lear, and then Macbeth, and then Antony and Cleopatra, and Coriolanus, and probably Timon of Athens. And then he... he, he all in the span of... All in the span of six or eight years, and then he went into the four last plays, which are 16... I guess uh, 10, 11, yeah. That's a good or reminder. 11 through 13. It's a good re reminder because of the, I mean, the bleakness in many ways of Macbeth following this play is a reminder of, okay, he's, it's recapitulating some of the earlier themes, but it's just so striking to have them back to back. Yes, and when you get to The Tempest, which we've talked about, 
All of that is just as if it's been boiled down and purified into this pure essence, you know, of the simplest, purest, most lyrical kind of language. All that same stuff we've been talking about is, is all there. It's just there in this kind of lyrical, refined so way. So what's your next course going to be for uh, If you want to take it, I'm going to offer probably in midsummer um, the history plays. I'm thinking of teaching Richard III, uh, Henry IV, Part One, um, uh, Richard II, Henry IV, Part One, and Henry V. So probably four plays. So if you want me to, I will think about scheduling that and let you know. And I will send you the link to our um, YouTube channel, which is going to have this all on videotape. And you can catch me in my <laughs> mistakes, <laughs> of which I can tell you there have been a few. <laughs> Thank you so much, my dears.